uh, so this is the project we are part of. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea was to capture the experiences and challenges of volunteers from these two countries, identify areas of mutual learning, and enhance uh, uh, the qualitative and quantitative base for volunteering and for sustaining the volunteering experiences in the pre and post disaster settings. So what we learned from these presentations today is that in Japan, uh, while, as well as in Australia, volunteers play a very vital role. Whereas in Japan, they have unique experience of managing a large number of ad hoc and spontaneous volunteers, but gradually NGOs, NPOs, local governments uh, are starting to play a key role in managing various tasks performed by the disasters. There is very little training given to the volunteers, and most of this training is mostly on site. And uh, by the some of the people who are more experienced volunteers, I was reading some papers where it says that 60% of the people who volunteered in the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami region were first time volunteers. But it means 40% of the people have volunteers elsewhere, and there were some NGOs and non profit organizations who were providing on site training because I myself volunteered at that time, I used to live in Japan. So I remember basic training was given about taking care of yourself, drinking enough water so that we don't feel heat stroke, and also when we are too much tired, letting another mate know that I'm very much tired or exhausted so that we are not harming ourselves as such. And uh, uh, there are some challenges to the episodic style of volunteering when disaster volunteering peak in the immediate aftermath of disasters and also during the weekends and long weekends or universities, you know, semester breaks or holidays, there are more people who are available for volunteering, but in the working days, there are less people who are volunteering in the disaster scene. However, the formal and long-term volunteering is rather uncommon in Japan, barring very, very few exceptions. And exceptions because there are many people who have volunteered in a number of different events in the last 20, 25 years whom I made. And uh, from the photos, we can see they contribute to cleanup operations and you know, also uh, operating some of the specialized equipments to managing the evacuation center, etc. And in, in, in Australia also we have volunteering as a way of life where many people in the community do volunteer. Uh, and uh, volunteer fire brigades were established around mid 19th century and emergency services have their origins in the civil defense which was established in around 1950s. And the emergency management volunteering teams in Australia look very different with their dress on or the high vis jackets on, and they provide very logistical support, uh, more uh, technological support, specialized support, as well as uh, welfare support, such as distributing food, etc., in the evacuation centers and so on. While in Australia, volunteers play a very vital role. Uh, however, the formal volunteering system remained very prominent uh, in the scene and as Mark has mentioned, about $2,000 is required for one volunteer to be recruited, trained and retained. No, just, just, the, just, just to recruit. Just, just the cost to set them up. Okay, just to cost to set them up. Just to point. training or anything else. Exactly. And after six or eight months, if they say we are leaving, then $2,000 worth of efforts and investment is you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there is a growing challenge uh, in the sector because the formal volunteering per se is declining, which you can see it is almost half in the last 10 years or so. And there is an alternative form of volunteering which is emerging and some of the experiences we hear through the Mud Army, but also digital volunteering, episodic volunteering, volunteering by the private sector. For example, uh, my friend who lived in Brisbane, his company said that, okay, Team A will go for volunteering in this week, Team B will go in this week, and so on. And also a skill-based volunteering where people are saying, I have chainsaws, I can do some things, but I don't want to be a part of any organization. So that kind of more of an alternative and episodic style of volunteering is increasing in Australia, but yet to be mainstream. And formal services uh, are very afraid of touching them because of the work health safety, insurance, what if they harm themselves, what if they sue some other day, if you put me in that situation on your advice, I went and then uh, something is not very well with me. So, and most of the alternative form of volunteering in Australia is happening in the post disaster phase as well. So, there are some, some, some lessons we are learning through these case studies. 
One one thing exists whether it is an individualistic culture or collectivist culture, be it in Australia, be it in Japan, even the Australian First Nations people as well as as well as majority of the migrant communities do represent collectivist culture and they come from predominantly. Uh, uh, however, you know Australia predominantly is an individualistic society, and within that society there are islands and communities of collectivist culture, and they both gel well with each other when it comes to volunteering, especially in the times of the severe crisis. That is how we have seen in the Brisbane floods, for example. Volunteering is fundamental for realizing the vision of community-based disaster reduction. This was highlighted by Professor Shaw. And we need to make volunteering a bit more fashionable and friendly because of the declining number of volunteers. And that could be uh, some of, there are some experiences of increasing the volunteering through organizing neighborhood walks, town watching, storytelling by the elders and children. For example, I moved in, 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 in the Northern Territory about eight years ago. Cyclone Trace Tracy is such an important and milestone event. I learn about it because it is my background uh, to learn about disasters. But I really want to see, make the annual story sharing by the Cyclone Tracy survivors, including people like you, Mark, who are little, but you know, who have seen it, been there, done it, and some storytelling, some experience sharing, so that in a, in a city like Darwin, where we have high rate of people who are coming and leave the territory with, after two, three years or so, they learn about these things. And plus also those who are here for a long time, but they have a bit of a sense of complacency, they can also revisit those times and memories and at least you know, uh, pay attention to the warnings released by the emergency services about various, you know, uh, various types of emergency or by the bomb, etc. Uh, and we need to celebrate disaster days and week the way we did, uh, I think, two weeks ago, the National Disaster Week. Similarly, we need to you know, celebrate disaster day or week. This is the system in Japan and they do it. Even the Prime Minister uh, put the highways on a Japanese Prime Minister and take part in uh, those you know, disaster uh, related celebrations or uh, days. And we should consider, I know volunteering is, if it is not my willingness, can you force me to do something? So the volunteering spirit is gone when the volunteering is not involved. But can we also consider making volunteering some kind of compulsory or more of a, uh, you know, acknowledgement activity, especially in places like schools, where school children can be involved in certain way, maybe, you know, one day they can walk, let's, let's say Nakara Primary School, they walk in the neighborhood, they maybe clean up some of the rubbish on the roads, they, they identify if they are hazardous objects, they identify some of the trees which are very old, they do a bit of a suburb watching and note down their experiences and make themselves a bit more aware of the, their own surroundings. And we, uh, in our teachings at CDU and elsewhere, we often highlight that we need to turn the tide in the disaster risk reduction, making it more proactive rather than reactive. And that is how, by inculcating some kind of, some kind of volunteering incentives in the schools, in the universities, CDU's value program, we can, we can certainly make it more proactive rather than just reactive kind of disaster response activities. We also need to nurture the inclusive volunteering. So people with different abilities, First Nations people, newly arrived migrants such as new students, international students, the Gen X who communicates more in the digital and virtual world rather than the real world, they all can meaningfully contribute and we need to think a bit more innovatively and out of the box to engage them in the emergency volunteering as well. Localization of volunteering is very important while we understand that a disaster and emergency management plans exist, but the communities not necessarily read it. I mean, I live in one of the northern suburbs uh, here and I know that not everybody will say that they have seen the emergency management plan. They are more for the emergency responders and agencies, etc. But also the communities need a bit of hand-holding to understand the do's and don'ts. For example, how to prepare the grab bag. In case there is an evacuation order, where to evacuate within the neighborhood or outside of the neighborhood. What are the things they should prepare? And can we do the neighborhood level mock drill, etc., which is not the culture at the moment in uh, Australia, for example. Volunteering provides a big purpose in life. It is a great way to build social and emotional well-being. It can reduce the very big mental health, which is certainly increasing year by year, day by day in Australia as well as in Japan. But volunteering is certainly a wonderful, uh, great way to 
to channel out some of those you know, mental health issues by way of finding a purpose in life. And volunteering can help reduce the complacency and bring more realism through the scenario-based drills. For example, when I have seen cyclone markers, I realize that in a country like Australia, the power can be off for a couple of days, runs can dry out. Uh, and uh, uh, some people think that the hospitals are always there to serve you, but they can be overwhelmed as well. And with the more climate change extreme events witnessing throughout the world, including in Australia, we have to, the first thing is we have to acknowledge that our emergency responders, emergency agencies, and the existing emergency service volunteers alone cannot serve everybody in the Black Swan events. And that is where we need to enhance at least a basic level of preparedness among the masses, among the communities at large, to help each other and to take care of themselves and be more realistic rather than living with the complacency. And we have to invent new language and, language and create new messages to encourage and inspire more people for volunteering. We need to identify existing entities for future volunteering, uh, such as schools and universities, and thanks to the CDO's value program. And we need to also identify existing entities to augment the current volunteer numbers, such as retired people. I know retired people gather in Kajuina, there are different coffees, areas where they gather literally every morning. And why shouldn't we, you know, go out of our comfort zone? Go and talk to them. There may be more people recruited in our uh, formal or non-formal um, kind of volunteering for emergency services. Corporate sector, resident associations, CB, community-based organizations, etc. We need to also find new entry points within the society which is rapidly diverse. We have many multicultural associations. Last weekend I attended Harmony Soiri at the waterfront. On 10th of June there will be a Naples festival. On 17th of June there will be India at Mendel. Darwin is full of wonderful multicultural communities. There are about hundreds of them. About hundred I was told. We need to go and talk to those communities because they do volunteer to organize those wonderful cultural programs. And if they can do so much well, far off from their home countries, they can certainly be game changer in you know, uh, changing the tide from being reactive to proactive uh, volunteers in the disaster risk reduction area. Also, there are hobbies in sports clubs, religious and worship centers, where people congregate on a, literally on a weekly basis. They interact and they also volunteer for a cause at, in those areas. And Australia and Japan should also invest in more international volunteering because international areas including Indonesia, Philippines, uh, all the Pacific nations, as well as elsewhere, they have very rich experience of managing large-scale emergencies and a lot of experience of community resilience as well. This is a short profile of Naka Ward of the Yokohama city. And you can see uh, they have a system of Jichikai and Chonaikai Basically, it means a neighborhood association of the local community. So, Naka Ward has a neighborhood association. And what they do, they organize the cleaning of the neighborhood canteen by the residents themselves on one of the weekends. They also do the rice cake pounding, which is more of a cultural activity in Japan. Uh, they have some anti-crime measures. Uh, plus, also they do summer festival. They also do the disaster prevention drill. And this is how the neighborhood associations which are formed but also registered with the local government and they communicate actively with the local government. They collect very small donations from each resident and they organize different activities which are about bringing people together. If we convert this into the Australian style, I think having, having a barbecue in the park or pizza in the park twice a year is not a difficult thing to do. And maybe someone who is trained in the emergency services, for example, or maybe senior volunteer, they can come and talk about the volunteering experiences they can, they can also understand people's challenges and stresses and they can also, you know, convey some messages about, for example, preparing the gap bag, where's the recreation center, uh, and how your community as a whole can respond to the emergency when there's a black swan event and so on. So with this, I would like to, you know, conclude that uh, disaster risk reduction will and is, is and will remain a shared responsibility and we need to continuously, proactively and sustainably engage volunteers, not only in the response and recovery, but also in the preparedness and prevention phase, so that we can build the resilience, which is the uh, ultimate aim of the disaster risk reduction activities. And I would like to uh, thank everyone who attended this forum in the face-to-face -face format as well as in the online format. 
and I would like to sincerely thank each of you for showing genuine interest in the topic of very, very important topic of volunteering. I would like to thank the esteemed guest speakers from Japan, from the emergency services, from the university, and the Australia Japan Foundation, and also the technical crew of the university, which includes Lani, which is uh, uh, not here today, Katrina, who is coming, popping in and out for taking pictures, Rodney, who is sitting here, he made all the arrangements here, and also the back-end support provided by the Marianne, Arvinda, and also the overall guidance of Professor Ruth Wallace. And uh, with this, I would like to now open the Q&A and discussion session. And I know those who are online are waiting quite patiently, so I would like to give them first go, and we would like to see what comments we receive from them. I'll start from the beginning, and I see who it is directed to. Uh, so, okay, so, oh, I can see people from India have participated, and in the a brief of bio of the speakers here, and then Angela CD, thank you very much for joining. Uh, she is a CDU colleague and a lot of experience of managing uh, the Howard Spring COVID response activities. Uh, she was leading, she was doing a very leadership role for more than a year at the Howard Spring uh, uh, Center in Darwin, where people who were found COVID positive were, <coughs> were taken away and they were doing isolation there. And uh, uh, there's a Mark's intro here, Caroline's brief introduction, Professor Kambra's introduction. Okay, so Rashid Rahman said, what a great story to share. And uh, he has shared a link about the information. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for your encouraging comments. Uh, but if you've got any question or any uh, anything to share, please feel free to type it down. And we can also open this up for this room for any Q&A discussion experience sharing anything. And I'm very proud to see two of the students here. Right, he has joined, he, has, he started studying with us last year in the second semester. Yes. And he, he is a First Nations Australian. He comes from TV Islands originally. Uh, originally Queensland, but okay. um, family connection to the TV Islands up here in the Territory in Adelaide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my, my association with um, emergency services is initially as a sort of lifesaver years ago. Uh, I've worked in paid and volunteer roles um, in a variety of uh, disaster and humanitarian and um, non-profit organisations. Um, I took out a couple of things out of the weekend that fell out of the um, conversations today. Um, obviously, um, well, konnichiwa sensei <laughs> shou, um, <laughs> Professor Kanabe, um, Mutashua Wade Des, <laughs> Surfing gaski deska, bidu gaski deska. <laughs> oh, this is great. You're so good at Japanese. Okay. Uh, yeah, look, the three C's, the communication, the collaboration and the consultation, is something that I'm thinking of in land care at the moment. I'm on the board there. And um, a succession plan is something uh, that's quite important to me. Now, we've got a, a land care board that's... Um, a lot older than me in many ways, and I'm somewhat fearful. I'm somewhat fearful that um, because of um, my nature and my uh, generation's um, attitude to volunteering, I don't think I'm going to be around as much as these people are around and they're managing our board and, and I'm putting my two bobs worth in when I'm able to attend board meetings. I, I'm really scared. Um, and I know that we're going to need a lot of people at, at my level and also underneath me. Um, the young people, uh, there's things like drones and the like that um, can potentially be utilised. I, um, I do, however, need to be very aware of the, um, the people in land care at the moment, the, the elder citizens um, who are the, they, they started it all off and, 